Hey guys, what is up? This is Aaron here. Just wanted to record a quick little intro to stick to the start of the match. Uh, if you can't tell, this is was post-recorded. I'm about to look like the fucking Revenant in just a minute. So this was recorded much later. Uh, just for two warnings for this match. Um, I believe if I remember correctly, because at this point it has been about over a month since we started recording, but I believe this was the first match we recorded uh, upon the return of Movie Battleground. Um... And so, because of that, there is a little more editing in this match than normal. You guys might find a couple extra cuts, uh, because there were a few things instructional and gameplay-wise that I messed up. Uh, both Sean and Grant are absolute champions for dealing with that, uh, including the just straight-up incorrect execution of a rule. Um, and like I said, they're both champs for dealing with it. Uh, they were kind of the guinea pigs upon the beginning of recording, and so I give them all the credit in the world for that, for dealing with it and putting up with it and still playing what is one of the best matches we've recorded. Just straight up, I will say that this was a great match. Uh, the other quick warning I want to give is uh, at some point in the middle of the match, uh, things get very heated, and there were barbs traded between the two competitors that even as soon as the round was over and stuff that has been edited out, you could tell that they uh, don't 100% agree with what was said. Uh, the incident and the literal on-camera resolution was left in the video. Uh, this was with the approval of the competitors. I made sure to speak to them the best that I could. Uh, and if there was any inclination that they wanted it gone, it would have been gone, but it has instead been left in. Um, and I just want to put it out there saying both of these guys are good dudes deep down. They're both reoccurring members of After Dark. Grant has been for a very long time. Uh, I wouldn't work with them on that much of a level if I didn't think they were good guys, and it was just a very heat-of-the-moment situation that led to some things that were said that both of them did not agree with the moment we finished this match, and since this match was recorded, they've both been on camera together for other things and for other purposes for TMG, and things have been all good since. Um, so I just wanted to throw that out there because I feel like if there wasn't any sort of warning about it, it may catch people off guard when it happens, but just know that uh, it was left in at the behest of the competitors. They were perfectly fine with it staying in the video, and um, that things are all good behind the scenes. Uh, everything live you've seen them on for After Dark has happened since this match was recorded, because as I said, we begun recording these about a month prior to the start. Uh, so with that said, I will stop delaying the video further, and I will let it begin. Enjoy the time on the Movie Battleground. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome back to the Movie Battleground. My name is Aaron Canole. I'm the producer of the show, and I'm your host tonight. And this is our second match back. Like I said yesterday, we are doing a big premiere week every single night, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. We have a match going up for you as a kind of celebration to relaunch Movie Battleground. Last night, we saw two rookies, Caleb Hansen and Frank Newberry, take each other on. I won't spoil the result of that match. Go check it out if you haven't. But tonight, we have a fun one. The uh, random wheel of death, as it probably should have been called, uh, decided that a ton of our rookies should get paired up against some vets of the game consistently, pretty much like as many as you possibly could. Uh, got paired up against Vets, and this one is a fun one today. A former Movie Battleground champion, one of three champions in this tournament, Grant Gregory returns to the Battleground. He will be taking on rookie Sean Hunter, who has played a couple of matches already in our sister league, TM Geek, on TMG Trivia, uh, but he is stepping over into debate for Battleground. Uh, so let's not waste any more time. I want to speak to these guys one-on-one -on -one very quickly as I bring in the man who was decided as the favorite by luck of the wheel. He is, as his name states, Mr. CBL there, Grant Gregory. Grant, how are you doing, man? Yeah, doing good. Excited to be here. I just got back from our annual Bill Cosby uh, meeting. Our, our man's out, so everyone's happy. 
Um, but yeah, no, I'm just excited to uh, to jump back into this. It's been I think over a year since I uh, uh, decided to, to hang it up, and um, be interesting to see uh, how how much of a ring rust is a thing. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, if anything will date when we recorded this video, it will absolutely be the Bill Cosby joke, but who gives a fuck at this point? Uh, so, like I said, uh, you were uh, one of two former champs, uh, two and a half if we're counting the position Joe's in right now, that are playing in this tournament. Uh, as you like to tout, uh, because you stepped away for personal reasons before you were ever able to lose the belt, you gave it up by choice. You do tout the undefeated uh, title around. What was your process of kind of getting back into the mindset for debate for coming into this match? I don't really know to tell you the truth. You said that you were doing it again, and you asked me if I wanted to do it, and I went, yep, yeah, why not? Um, All right. Uh, My biggest I, I, thing is I I got so into it to the point where it was just it was just all consuming and I always say after every match I always use the phrase it's like it feels like I've been beaten up underwater because you just you can't breathe you just fall you start you tired you can't even celebrate properly and yeah no it's um it's good and I'm good to see glad to see we've got some um uh, new new people I've never met uh, Sean before but um yeah he seems like a nice lad and loves his posters so yeah. Absolutely. That's a recurring theme throughout these first 16 matches prior to the tournaments is uh, just a bunch of people meeting people they've never met. So I'll go ahead and drop you to the back temporarily as I'll bring in his competitor entering second, making his movie Battleground debut, though he boasts the same current record Grant does after the reset at zero and zero. He is Mr. Sean Hunter. Hello. Those of you... For those of you who watch TM Geek, he, yes, he is the man who writes his answers on a plate. Though there is no need for a plate <laughs> today, uh, as we will not be answering trivia questions. We will be debating movie topics. Sean, first off, how are you? And second off, I'll ask you kind of a similar question. Uh, what, As someone who's never done this before, what did you do that you think helped prep you best without giving too much away to your opponent? Uh, well, I'm good, and I'm writing writing on paper now instead of a plate, which is uh, just fun times. It's very different for me. Uh, never done uh, any kind of debating before. I guess the only prep I've had is all the uh, movie fights that I used to watch, uh, and also just the tips and pointers Grant gave me in the chat. Uh, so I really appreciate it that and i uh just really excited to play them and uh i think i'm gonna get crushed but i want to have fun doing it <laughs> that, that, hey hey that's that is honesty if i've ever seen it uh so i, I can at least appreciate that honesty uh john awesome to have you here man looking forward to it uh, i will go ahead and bring in your competitor uh so to briefly run over the rules again for the people and for these guys, they are going to debate in four rounds of open debate. The questions were sent to them ahead of time for prep time. Should the match end in a 2-2 score, there is a blind round question, which they will have time on hand to prep for, uh, but they do not know what that is ahead of time. With that said, the way that the debate will actually go, uh, there are four stages to the debate. First, there will be a 60-second opening argument from each competitor. Then there will be two minutes of solo time to build on your argument before we get to four minutes of open round debate. That's your chance to fight. That's your chance to scrap. That's your chance to go at it to get out as much as you can before you get a one-minute closing. This is a reminder to both competitors. You do hold a one-minute extension. If at any point during the match you would like to extend either your opening, your closing, or your two-minute flush-out time to three minutes, all you have to do is let me know before we begin the question, uh, but that is your friendly reminder that you do have that should you want to use it. Uh, other than that, all that's left is to debate. So with that said, are there any questions and are we ready to go? Yep. All right. That's confident as we'll get here. So we'll go ahead and get into question number one. And before we do, uh, as we should do on screen, Mr. Gregory, as the person who was spun for the favorite, would you like to go first on questions one and three or first on questions two and four? I'll go on two and four. Two and four. Awesome. So, Sean, you will be up first for this question. Your question is, what is the best Jim Carrey movie of all time? A man 
who to many people is an all-time comedian. He sometimes fancies himself a dramatic actor too. We will see what these gentlemen went with. So with that said, uh, unfortunately, we do not have our perfect timer graphic ready quite yet. Maybe by the end of the week we'll have it. Uh, so we do have our very large and obvious timer that will be pulled up at the start and end of every debate. Uh, with that said, I will disappear to the back. And Sean, you are up first. One minute of opening starts when you begin speaking. Jim Carrey, the man that can make you laugh and cry just by the flailing of his limbs. Uh, his best movie is The Truman Show. And not only is it that his best movie, it's the best Jim Carrey performance. He won a Golden Globe for that performance. He, he absolutely played both sides of the coin, comedic elements and the dramatic elements in this film. You really felt him as an actor it wasn't jim carrey from the mask or from dumb and dumber it was jim carrey playing an actual human person that can make you laugh and make you feel not only did i love his performance in this film critics loved his performance the box office was amazing for this movie and just the actors around him also did stellar performances and when you have actors around you that are that good, like Ed Harris, who won the Oscar for Best Supporting Performance, that elevates everyone else in the film, and that definitely elevated Jim Carrey's performance in this film. It's his best ever. All right. Right on the money. Grant, you have one minute of opening. Time starts when you begin speaking. To define what the best Jim Carrey movie, you have to define what Jim Carrey is. This is what I will be are doing. Jim Carrey has had multiple layers and everything, but when you think of Jim Carrey, you don't think of a Golden Globe uh, actor of drama. You think of something commit. You think of as um, someone with wacky faces, wacky limbs, caricatures. Um, the film that I'm picked, the film that I've picked, has all of those to boot. Plus, it also has a serious element to, to it in a comedic way, which is the, which is quintessential Jim Carrey, and that's me, myself, and Irene. You're talking about a film where you've got a really tragic home situation and dealing with it, with dealing with a, a severe mental issue and turning it into comedy gold, something that is repeatable, something that is laughable, something that just makes everything about his performance and the film the best Jim Carrey movie. Not the best movie, the best Jim Carrey movie. All right, Sean, it is time for your rebuttal. You have two minutes on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. So we look at the question, it's Jim Carrey's best film. Obviously, his best film would be Dumb and Dumber, or Ace Ventura, or The Mask. Those are classic Jim Carrey performances as Jim Carrey. But if you look at Jim Carrey and how he changed himself as an actor, you don't just think of those movies and the funny comedic Jim Carrey. You think of the serious films he's done like The Majestic, like The Truman Show, The uh, Spotless Mind, Man on the Moon. Jim Carrey changed who he was as an actor. And because of that, because he wanted to be taken seriously as an actor, you really see the different sides of the coin that he played in The Truman Show. Someone that is so funny can also play so sad, so moving. You need to be strong in both those elements. And if you look at me, myself, and Irene, that's clearly not his best performance as Jim Carrey. He's more Jim Carrey in the mask, Dumb and Dumber, Yes Man, Ace Ventura, When Nature Calls. Those are classic Jim Carrey being Jim Carrey films. Me, myself, and Irene, it didn't do well at the box off. It's, 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 it's a forgettable film that people did not like. They didn't like his depiction of a person who had uh, schizophrenia. Um, a lot of people just didn't like that performance. And if you look at the other elements of the film, the story wasn't that good. Renee, Renee Zellweger wasn't that good in that film. If you look at the Truman Show, everyone hits all the actors. Peter Weir directed a fantastic film. That film was uh, nominated for uh, for directing, for best supporting actor, and for best screenplay. It is by far... When you look at Jim Carrey's career, the shining stone in his crown is the Truman Show. That is when he elevated far beyond what he started as and became who Jim Carrey is now as an actor. And time. All right. So, Grant, two minutes is on your clock to expand and rebut. Time starts when you begin speaking.
you just stated that the, that film was the film that made Jim Carrey the actor who he is now. The actor who he is now is irrelevant. So by your own words there, you're saying that this is the film that made Jim Carrey essentially an irrelevant actor. He hasn't had any hits or anything. My film, and once again, I feel like you've missed the question, it's not It's not the best film that Jim Carrey's been in. It's the best Jim Carrey movie. What is quintessential Jim Carrey? He's playing He's playing a multitude of characters. He's able to diversify like that. He didn't have, he just called it, I think he said it was just schizophrenia. It was paranoid, delusional schizophrenia with involuntary narcissistic rage. It's what he had. It, it is the condition, and it was played very very close to the belt but it also gave light to a lot a lot not not many people knew about that beforehand your film is saying everything is good around it the actors and everything like that but it's not a jim carrey film your film is a good film it's a film film that i i enjoy but it's a muted version of jim carrey jim carrey movie is full on out there you mentioned the mask and all that and even when you're talking about his best performance i think the smallest thing that you've Oh, well, look, is his best performance in a serious role, probably The Majestic. My film is Jim Carrey to a T. It's fun, it's goofy, he can he can have a laugh. It has a great story. You said, you said everyone's, oh, they're not good, they're not this, they're not that, but nothing was elaborated on. Your film would be bad without the supporting cast. That, what, that's what that makes Jim Carrey's performance is good. But a good performance from Jim Carrey does not make a Jim Carrey feel. He had a good, good uh, performance in the number twenty-three, and that was a terrible film. My my film is Jim Carrey to a T. It's his wackiness, it's his creativeness, um, it's his off the quick. And the fact of the matter is that his story within that is one, as you said, multiple sides. He's taking on children who aren't his own and doing it in the most loving and funny way. And that is time. All right, so this is the open debate. This is where you guys will scrap for as much time as possible. The clock will start when one of you speaks. You said, me, myself, and Irene, Jim Carrey, is, it's his best performance because he is himself. He's doing things that he's done before. But for me, this film and Jim Carrey's performance in this film is Jim Carrey light. He's really repeating himself. He's repeating the things that he's done in the past that is that have made him funny. Things in the past that worked better in other films. And his performance in this film just did not work because it reminds you of past Jim Carrey performances. Whereas, and the film just doesn't. So, you, so you write your own words. It reminds you of a Jim Carrey film. It's the most Jim Carrey because it reminds you of other Jim Carrey films. Your movie doesn't better remind you of other Jim Carrey films. performances. It's not, it's not just about the performance, it's about the most Jim Carrey movie, and this is, because as you just stated yourself, this is the film that makes you remember and think about that. Oh, okay, got that from there, got that from there. That's cool. It's the culmination of everything that makes a Jim Carrey movie a Jim Carrey movie. You say, your film your film doesn't. Your film is a much more, you're talking about, it was like, Jim Carrey was, you could have replaced Jim Carrey with anyone in that, and it would have made zero difference. You could not replace Jim Carrey in my film, and it would be the same film. It, my film is a Jim Carrey film because it is Jim Carrey to a T. Everything that he does is is Jim Carrey. In in every single thing, um, when, whether it's whether he's acting, his timing, his goofy, his goofy laugh. You try and get someone else to do that sort of laugh, and, and it works. In your film, it's much more muted. I think you could totally put Robin Williams in Me, Myself, and Irene, and he would be a suitable or better replacement. For uh, to replace Jim Carrey, I don't think that film relies on Jim Carrey and his performance. I, I could see a whole bunch of other comedic actors. I think Jim Carrey really stands out in the Truman Show because he's so funny and could go flip the coin and be so sad. You see the duality in his performance, whereas other comedic actors like Robin Williams, his uh, his other performances that have been more serious have not been as good as his comedic performances. Whereas Jim Carrey in this in this film has been you just you just you just stated that um the funniest man in the world is the person that would take up obviously robin williams in a comedic role will take over everything else he was the funniest man in the world for a reason literally any actor could have taken over over um jim carrey in the truman show and, and it would be just as good there is so many actors who are serious it worked for the audience because they're used to seeing him 
in a certain way. It wasn't the most Jim Carrey film. That was the reason why I got much more praise. They're like, oh, okay, so he can do other things. This is cool. We're used to seeing Jim Carrey this way. After that, his box office his box office went down. The 90s and everything, the Jim Carrey and that is the quintessential 90s stuff. And that's what he brought to me and myself on our own. It is the most Jim Carrey film. Your film isn't. It's because he wasn't Jim Carrey. The people are like, oh, that's interesting. That's pretty good. I like that different side of him. But then when he tried to do more stuff like that, it didn't work. He doesn't work as a serious, uh, uh, as, as a serious actor. Jim Carrey's box office did not go down after that film. He did do a couple of serious films after that. But when he went back to comedic films like Bruce Almighty and Yes Man, his box office went way up and was higher than the than his previous performances. And if you go back to the Truman Show and Jim Carrey's performance in there, he is Jim Carrey in that film. In the comedic moments, he's fully Jim Carrey. He's making you laugh with his body, with his facial expressions. That's where the comedic uh, energy is coming from. It's not from, like, he's not saying any jokes in that film. There's no jokes in the Truman Show. The funny parts are coming from Ju uh, Jim Carrey's uh, body behavior. Absolutely wrong. Jim Carrey body behavior is me, myself, and Irene. Every single scene just drips with Jim Carrey. You take Jim Carrey out of the Truman Show and replace him with anyone, it will still work. You cannot take him out of me, myself, and Irene. Me, myself, and Irene is a forgettable flat. film. And time. All right, a good, solid debate there. You guys have one minute left to close to get your last points home before we bring in the judges to finish this round off. Sean, you are up first. Time starts when you speak. Me, Myself, and Irene is a forgettable Jim Carrey film. It was the low point of his comedic films uh, in the early 2000s. It was a box office failure. I think you could really replace Jim Carrey with other comedic actors and they could do as good or better of a performance than Jim Carrey did. Again, the mental health issues and how it was portrayed in that film did not sit right with some groups and they did write letters to the film and the, and the director and whatnot. Also, it's not a fun film. A lot of people didn't find it to be a fun film when it came out. Jim Carrey being schizophrenic is not a funny laugh, laugh thing. It's a sad thing. It's not his best performance. And I don't mean sad in like, uh, oh, wow, he's acting really good. This is sad. It's just like he sh someone like this is not acting as a schizophrenic person should. They're not taking this material seriously. Something like that should have been taken seriously. And time. All right. Right on the money there. Grant, you are the last to speak here. One minute starts when you speak. The mental health issue wasn't taken seriously because it wasn't a serious film. If you're talking about people writing letters and I'm being upset, every single film has that. So that's not that that's not a point. Your your main focus on thing is Jim Carrey being not Jim Carrey in this film, and that's the reason why people like it because he was he, because he was different. My film is Jim Carrey to a T. You even said it your own words that this reminds you of all of his other films. It reminds you it's the most Jim Carrey because you can take Jim Carrey out of your film and replace him with with any dramatic actor and it will still work it will it will still work you cannot replace anyone with except for the exception as, as you said robin williams the funniest man on the planet you could found one person that, that, was, that was funnier to replace it no one knew about the if you want to go about the disease no one knew about paranoid delusional schizophrenia with involuntary narcissistic rage before that thing it's a serious condition and it got people got people to people to know it my film is jim carrey because Jim Carrey oozes out of every single scene. You remove Jim Carrey from one scene, and it's no longer a Jim Carrey film. Jim Carrey, and Jim time. Carrey. All right. A solid way to end a Jim Carrey fight with Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey, Jim Carrey. Great job, guys. No, I only second. said it twice. I only said it twice. Only said it twice. Okay. So he won't be showing no, I, don't, I do but, apologize. Uh, he will not no, be I don't, I don't, I don't want the judge again. to think that I said it three times. So, you know, that would have been over the All time right. limit. That is fair. That is absolutely fair. Scratch that third one from the record, boys. That is on me. So I will go ahead and drop you guys to the back. That was a great first debate. Uh, take some water. Take a break. As I bring in the judges that are with us today, we have Mr. Jacob West, Chris Diaz, and Mr. Haven Pendergast. All right. Do you guys need 30 more seconds to decide, or are we ready to go? No. I did. All right. So it looks like we're good all around. So with that said, uh, in 30 seconds or less for each of you, I start with 
Papa, uh, who is your winner and what is the main point that sold you? Um, I really liked this question and both arguments around. Sean is getting my point. Um, he was able to, to really hammer home why the movie itself is better than the other movie. He made the comment of um, me, myself, and Irene is, unforget is forgettable. Um, nothing was said about that. Um, and then just, especially with that, that closing, just, just saying how the movie itself was better. Um, and they're both Jim Carrey performances and Jim Carrey movies. All right. So first vote goes to Sean. Mr. Diaz, where does your vote go towards in 30 seconds or less? So this is tough. Like, people are taking it for a very good grant. I thought he stayed on target for the whole argument and question. He stayed to the question that was the best in a movie, not that the best in any performance. He kind of got lost with the question because he kind of messed something out. He kind of started an argument a lot of time and then pulled more down from the movie. I bet he had pulled more down from the movie to play that argument, but I bet he argument all around. All right, so a vote per, which means we move on to Mr. Ladon Blanche. Haven, where does your where does your vote go towards and the point? My vote goes to Grant. They both did well. I just think Grant was more prepared. I know this was Sean's first match, but I, I think in the third um the third setting when they were going head to head i think grant was just able to edge out you know when he was able to battle him verbally you know back and forth you know he made some great points they both did but at the end of the day you know grant's argument was just a little more compelling at the end all right so the experience and argument clearly being what gives the edge there uh, so we will drop our judges to the back. Thank you, guys. We will see you all in just a little bit. As we bring back in our two competitors, as it says at the bottom, the score is one nothing to Grant, but there are still plenty of questions to score points in. And so with that, we will go ahead and move on to a question. Uh, so the first film, uh, the debate back and forth was, what is the most Jim Carrey, Jim Carreyist, Jim Carreyist assist of things? Uh, so let's move on to a director who is known for being in such his own style that uh, I mean, you have to talk about his style over his style. The question is, what is Christopher Nolan's most underrated film? Christopher Nolan has, albeit a very small filmography compared to others, but it's a filmography that has a number of beloved pictures, but not all of them get the love that some feel they deserve, and that is what we will be discussing. Mr. Gregory, as you opted to go first on this one, you will be up first, because that's how that works. So you will have one minute to open your argument. Time starts when you begin speaking. Christopher Nolan is known for his uh, flashy effect, his brilliant um, work behind and uh, behind the camera, and his writing is is impeccable. People think of Christopher Nolan; they tend to think more of the the blockbuster type sort of stuff. I pulled it back to a film that was, um, let's just say, there was something about it that that touched me and took me to the point. That's insomnia. We're talking we're talking about a film that's set in a small location with um, only a, a hand, handful of actors that was a very powerful and unappreciated film because when something is underrated it's underappreciated it's not it's not talked about but it still holds the quality of something that is good and it's easy to say that well Christopher Nolan hasn't had a bad film and so it, it's hard it's hard to rate um, that but my film is definitely the most underrated because it's brilliant. All right. Uh, for the sake of the show, I don't believe, unless it was cut out because they were choppy for a second, I don't believe you said what your film was. I did. Um, okay, then it must have been when it was choppy. Yeah. Could you just repeat it for me again? My film is Insomnia. There we go. All right. There we go. It got choppy in the middle there for a second. So there we go. Glad we were able to get that through. All right, Sean, we will, oh, move, on. We will move on to you. One minute on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking.
My Christopher Nolan film that is underrated is Interstellar. I believe that this film is not valued highly enough, and that is why it is underrated. He was coming off banger after banger after banger of good films. There was so much hype. The trailers looked amazing for this film. It was like Christopher Nolan's 2001 A Space Odyssey. This film came up. People were so hyped, and we get to that third act. And a lot of people, when this film first came out, did not like it. They did not like that third act. Matthew McConaughey became a meme. Anne Hathaway's character just does crazy things for love. And they didn't like spoilers. They didn't like that Matthew McConaughey uh, ended up in an alien test rack at the end of it. This is not the film that people wanted to be. But over the years, people go and look back at this film, look at the visuals, the cinematography, Matthew McConaughey's acting, and the score. This is an amazing, underrated film. And that is time. Perfect. All right, so that is the fight, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, both of his eye films, Insomnia and Interstellar, both great picks. Uh, the follow-up, the expansion is here. Grant, you're up first. Time starts when you speak. I want to start off by saying there is a lot that my opponent said that I agree with. The score is fair, it, but it is a big blockbuster film, and it went that way. The fact that every time I spoken to someone about the film they talk about how good it looks um how great the sound is and if they're talking about how good the, how good the film is it's very very appreciated it's very it's rated very high it's, it, it's rated as one of the most um one, one of the best scores that we've seen I in a while my film is not that my film is a film that small on a smaller scale, but still just as good in quality. Both of our films have very, very similar um, acting prowess when it, when it comes to what we're talking about. We've got Al, we've got Al Pacino, but Hilary Swank, we've got Robin Williams. And um, thank you for the, the little stab earlier in your previous one. I like that. Um, I appreciate that. Um, Robin Williams in, 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 a, in a serious role um, where he's cold and, and, and chilling. This, this film was the film that made people go, maybe he can do more. Maybe he's more than just the, the goofy drug addict that we've seen for the past 40 years. My film isn't appreciated in the levels of other Christopher Nolan's because it's not black. The reason why your film worked, your film was promoted so much and it, people still still people still love it. People people love it. It's on, it's on a lot of lists for their favourite favorite films. It, it, it's higher on most films. My film, my film isn't. And you said that in your film that there was stuff that people didn't like in the third act and that's, that's not to do with it being under pressure. That's, that's to do with it not being as, as good as what it could have been. He dropped the ball on that. You, could, you couldn't change anything in my film um, because people, people are like, like what it is, but they don't appreciate it globally. Anti. All right, Sean, you have two minutes of expansion and rebuttal time to yourself. Time starts when you begin speaking. I feel like a lot of people have not gone back and revisited Interstellar. So that first taste of it they got in their mouth, that's the perception that they've carried on throughout the years of that film. But if they went back, they would see how great that film is. The quality of the third act obviously makes people not like that film in the first place. But if they go back, they would see that the film as a whole is amazing. If you look at Insomnia, it's a really good film. It's a great remake. Robin Williams and I think Al Pacino has an amazing performance in that film. Christopher Nolan wasn't known for blockbusters at that point. He did the following, then Memento, and then Insomnia. A lot of critics and people really, really liked Insomnia, and it still holds up to this day. It's not like people liked it and it's gone down. Like, it has a 92% on Rotten Tomatoes, a 78 on Meta Metacritic. This is a film that people have liked and have always liked. Whereas Interstellar is a film that people were so hyped for, saw it, didn't like it, and then a lot of people have not revisited it because of their first viewing of that film. And that's why I think it's underrated. Whereas Insomnia, it's not underrated. It is a really good film, and Al Pacino does a really good performance in it. I don't think you could say the qual just because the quality of the third act isn't that good. Like that 
that for sure affects people's perception of that film. And if, if it affects it that much, it means they're not going to go back to it. A lot of people have watched Insomnia many times, especially since it's one of the earlier films that Nolan, uh, that, that, that came out in, in Nolan's career. Like, again, especially if you look at the third act of Insomnia, it's really good. It's a good twist. Some say it's better than the remake. A lot of critics and people really enjoyed that film and still enjoy it to that day. It is not dipped in the minds of people. And time. All right, guys. Good expansions there on your arguments. There are now four minutes on the clock for you to scrap for. Time starts when more one person speaks. Absolutely. Absolutely. The perception has changed because Christopher, a Christopher Nolan film, people don't think of that. That's why when you think of a Christopher Nolan film, you think of the big... Uh, big special effects, the big long things, the blockbuster. You think, and that's what it is. It's a Christopher Nolan film. At the time, yes, it, it got the rating. That, 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 you don't change ratings po post haste. That, that's that, that's that's not the the argument. Your film is hugely loved. It's had more eyeballs on something on that than than Insomnia has. And, so you said, and everything you said was right. Everything that Al Pacino does and all the characters are good. That's 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 the point. You're, it's you're good. describing you're, so it was never yeah, exactly. underrated because it's always been good. Whereas people think that my film Yes, it's always been good, but it's never it's never on the tier list. When you think of Christopher Nolan films, it's never on it's never it's never on the, the higher tier list. Inter In Interstellar was one of the ones no one's memeing about that because no one wants to talk about um insomnia. The More way in which you determine the film means it has a higher chance to fall from grace. Also, you talked about Christopher Nolan doing blockbusters. He's done just as many films that aren't blockbusters. Following Memento, The Prestige, Insomnia. Dunkirk, I guess, was a smaller film. I'm sure the budget was really big, but looking at it as a blockbuster, it was. it's not The Dark Knight or, or Interstellar or stuff like that. So he has done a bunch of his films have not been blockbusters. Yeah, but four four hundred million dollars isn't a blockbuster. We're talking about something that's a small. It, it, it's it's a small screen thing. You're saying about my film being good, therefore it's appreciated. It's not. That's 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 what the whole point of um, an underrated and underappreciated film. It is one of the best films, but it's never talked about as the best films. When you ask any random person about the best films for that, Interstellar always gets mentioned beforehand. It had all the press. It has all the eyes. It has all the memes. When and this is the way that you know something's appreciated. When, some, when someone is able to take something from the film and, and expand upon it and, and talk about it. If you look about at crying memes and everything like psychological that. Psychological, when was the last meme you dramas, Nolan's smaller films, Insomnia always gets brought up. If you're looking at Nolan's blockbusters, Interstellar doesn't come up. You hear Inception. Okay, so, so, you so you're, 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 you're taking Dark it in different, different blocks. Okay, Pardon? well, it, it, by that, every single time that they talk about a film, that, that that's in the Batman series, and so many never gets brought brought up. You, you're you're trying to change the goalpost halfway through it. That's not the question. The the question is which was the most underrated, under underappreciated overall. Most people haven't seen that. They most people have seen seen that and just didn't like it. There's a difference between and, a film being underrated and not and and, and people not liking it. Interstellar and most people who got saw the stars. Interstellar didn't like it again because Matthew McConaughey is just saying Murph for like half the film, which left a bad taste in their mouth and they haven't gone back to see how great of a film it is. The people who have known since it came out that it is a great film know that it's underrated because the majority of the populace doesn't think highly of it. Whereas a lot of people, and I'd say more people think Insomnia is a better film because of the performances, because of the solid I plot. I can guarantee All more, three people have seen, more, people, more people have seen your film th than my film. Um, as you said, eyes don't, eyes don't make the, you're talking about why your film is bad. And the only reason why it can be good is if you go back and watch it again. So the only way to, to appreciate your film is, is by multiple, multiple, multiple films. That's not the question. If that was the question, then I'd have a completely different, 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 um, A lot of people have seen that. Insomnia. It starred Al Pacino and Robin Williams and Hilary Swank, like, Look at those three actors. Like people have seen Insomnia. It yes, is a well seen film. Yes, and it's still underappreciated. Even though you said it was good, we I said it was good, and you're st and it's still underappreciated. Your film is always put on a high tier. If you look at the critical review no. and just the people, sorry, uh, yeah. sorry mute button. Hey, that hey, is Ron. time. 
Are you thank there? you. I, I am. Yeah. Mute, mute button happened, but thank you both for being respectful. That is the one thing I appreciate most out of you guys. Uh, so with that said, uh, it is time for closing arguments. Grant, you are up first. One minute to close this out. You talk about a film that's un it's underrated and, and it's underappreciated overall. We both agree that it's a good film. That's not the question. The question is most um, uh, underrated and it's under underappreciated because whenever you talk to anyone about a global uh, the, the, the global work of Christopher Nolan, that is never a film... That, that that is up up high. Interstellar is also even though even though it has its bad points to it, it is still higher than a film that we've both said is much much better. You're talking you're talking Collider, you're talking Vanity Fair, Rock Rolling Stones. They have all said they've all had the, the list that were higher. He's bringing up uh, scores from Rock Tomatoes and everything that that will that were based on what people think at the time. It, it's it's that good of a film that it's got a much higher score, yet it's never in the conversation about uh, about the films. Interstellar. Uh, Dark Knight, Prestige, all these other ones are the ones that pe people people talk about when they're talking about Christopher Nolan films. It's never in Sumner. It's never about the small town uh, with Al Pacino, Hilary Swank, and that's the reason why it's most unappreciated. And times. All right. Sean, last minute to speak. Time starts when you start. Underrated. Underestimate the value and importance of this film. People understand how good Insomnia is, even to this day. It's one of Christopher Nolan's best films, especially because of the performances in that film from Robin Williams, Hilary Swank, and Al Pacino. Taking a remake and making it better, more exciting than the original is something that people have gone back to look at and have realized how good it is. Whereas Interstellar, to this day, people do not like it because of the third act. They base the whole film on the third act, even though it is a great film. They don't go back and look at it and reward it on the entirety of it. They just remember the first time they watched it and how they didn't like the ending. All right, and that is time on that one. Once again, another hard, well-fought match from both of you. You guys will get sat in the back for the moment. While we bring in our three judges to make their calls, uh, it should be said while I give them one last second to finish up here, uh, just a couple of numbers and facts that were brought up if anybody was curious because I did the research. Uh, both Insomnia and Interstellar have at least an over 70% score on Rotten Tomatoes in both audience and critics. It should both be said that Underseen, uh, if that's the angle for Christopher Nolan, doesn't mean much. Both have so many audience reviews that they are at the 10,000 and plus, or 100,000 and plus number. So clearly a lot of people have seen them no matter what. So it's based on the argument. Uh, it was also brought up Dunkirk's budget. For those curious, the movie was made for around $100 million, although its exact number is not currently known. It was just known it was in that early $100 million range, which is the cheapest film he had made uh, since The Prestige, which only cost $40 million to make. Uh, so with that said, you will go ahead and head to our judges for the decision. Uh, another really interesting fight. I like how both of these gentlemen take different approaches to how they read the question. Uh, underrated in terms of how many people have seen it versus underrated and how many people have given it a true shot uh, after maybe having seen it. So it's an interesting discussion. Chris, in 30 seconds or less, who made a bigger impact on you and who is the point going to? I had a thing on the exam. I had to go with man. He made a stronger argument like, about the movie not but to do that. We're actually trying to proceed it on a little bit too much but uh, uh, and him every single moment of this argument, and he went thing and Okay. All right. So the first vote goes to Grant. That means I will go on to Haven. Who does your vote go to? And briefly, what pushed you over the edge? My vote goes to Sean uh, for this round. Um, he spoke a little more facts, you know, when he talked about Ron Tomatoes and things like that. They both mentioned their uh, actors in the movie, but 
uh, you know, I would have appreciated more like a release date, how far along Chris no for Nolan, you know, was um, doing his thing. But they didn't really hit the head on that. But Sean kept nailing the head on Interstellar, you know. Um, so, yeah, I have to give it to him for this one. All right. So that means one vote from each for our judges. Papa, you are the decider in 30 seconds or less. Who does your vote go to? Uh, I am also going with Grant. Um, but, uh, it was brought up pretty quickly that, you know, when you think of Christopher Nolan, you think of the big budget movies and Interstellar. Well, no, it's not a, the best movie. Um, it is definitely up there, uh, whereas a lot of people do forget about Insomnia. Um, Grant was able to hit that home very quickly in the match and just keep building up the argument throughout. So I'm going to have to give it to him. All right, absolutely. So with that, as I drop our judges to the back, thank you all, gentlemen. The, the score we have right now is 2-0 to zero as I bring our competitors back in, but this is still far from over as we move on to question number three. Uh, and since the return of Battleground, uh, this is something that I know I used to do back in the day uh, on and off is a pitch question. I give you something that's a little broader. I need you to give me some kind of pitch. What sounds the most interesting? And this is a hell of a one because this is a concept that most people would rather not touch. So we went there. The question is, what trilogy should get a fourth movie and then pitch what it would be? Uh, so with that said, I will go ahead and bring up the timer, obviously, as before. You have a one-minute intro. Grant elected to go second, which means, Sean, you are up first. So the time will start when you begin speaking. So the question was, what trilogy should get a fourth film and pitch it? My pick is the Godfather franchise. So I'm going with Godfather 4, directed by Martin Scorsese, taken, uh, being written by Francis Ford Coppola, coming back to write it, based on some of the books by Mario Puzo. I'm bringing back Al Pacino, Robert Duvall, who was not in Godfather 3, Diane Keaton, uh, Talia Shear, and Andy Garcia, and adding new actors to the mix, uh, John Bernthal, Ray Liotta, and Andrew Garfield. I want to see this franchise continue. The Godfather 3 was not a bad film, and a lot of uh, the thing that people didn't like in The Godfather 3 was Sofia Coppola. And you know what? She's not coming back in this fourth one. Because spoilers, she died in the third one. So the thing that you did not like is not coming back. And yes, I know Godfather 3 was not as good as the first two. But I think seeing where Al Pacino is now after the death of, death of his daughter is a good place for a sequel. for four And films. time. All right. So I just want to get ahead of it because I know emotions fly quick. Grant, I saw your face. The argument is not whether Godfather 3 is good. I'll just make sure to put that out there. Uh, and judges in the back, since I saw some of your faces as well, it does not matter whether I or not you want these I wasn't even going to mention that. I just, I love the fact that that's what he said. I'd made, I, it I genuinely to, made me happy. Uh, so, judges, I see you, some of you behind the scenes. I just do have to say, uh, it's not whether or not you want these films. Please take your own personal opinion out of it. This is solely on what they give you. Uh, with that said, Grant, you have a minute on the clock. Time starts when you begin speaking. The film that I have decided that needed a fourth um, is the Blade series. Um, it will be Blade roughly based on the Mark and Drake story Sins of the Father that came out in uh, 1998 with a bit more of a modern twist. So it's, it's not as 90. So you, you've got Blade. He's now much older. He's now moved back to his um, mother's hometown um, in Latvia. And he's, he's, he's understanding that the world doesn't want vampire hunters anymore. The world has now diminished when it comes to that because Blade, because he was hyper efficient. Vampires have now fallen back into this idea of being a myth that people don't know about. Them. This is a film that has a pretty good cast, which I will get into. Um, it has a lot of intrigue, um, a few twists here and there, um, one of which I can spoil. The purpose of this film is to continue something that the only reason why it was essentially stopped was because someone couldn't pay their I'll finish that line for you. Wesley Snipes evaded taxes, ladies and gentlemen. If you didn't know that, 
<laughs> learn a little bit of pop culture. All right, guys, you have two all important minutes to flesh out your stories here. Give us what we are getting the goods in the Godfather for and Blade for. Uh, Sean, you are up first time starts and you speak. This is the Irishman, but Godfather for. I want to see stuff that happened in the past. So we're going to see Al Pacino de-aged and see what he went through after his daughter died and how he dealt with that, how he wanted revenge, how him and Andy Garcia's character, how they felt, because that's a really traumatic thing. And then I want to cut to the future and see new characters like John Bernthal, Ray Liotta, and Andrew Garfield dealing with the present, dealing with, dealing with Al Pacino's character, having gone legit, but now in the story in the future, he's... You know, his past has caught up to him. He's killed a lot of people. He's done a lot of stuff. His crimes are coming back to haunt him. He is now on trial for a lot of the murders and things he's committed as he, when he was the godfather. So in the future, I want to see him repenting for his sins, going through trial after trial, seeing what would happen to him as his family, who would be played by John Bernthal and Andrew Garfield and Ray Liotta, how they're dealing with his affairs and the world now as it is. And at the end of it, I still want to see a character from his past because Al Pacino got revenge after his daughter died on the family. I know the, the leader of that, the, the Don, was killed. But I feel like Al Pacino's character would want revenge on the entire family after his daughter died. And I want to see Al Pacino's character essentially get whacked just before he gets sentenced uh, to go away. And I think that would be a great way to see the ramifications of the Godfather 3 and then bring it to the future to see him repent for all of his sins and everything that has done. I think Martin Scorsese would direct the hell out of this thing. Francis Ford Coppola coming back to write this. He's written, he's helped write the last three Godfather films. And, and as I said before, the Godfather 3 is not great, but it's good. And I feel like Godfather 4 could be really great too. That is time. Yes, absolutely. All right. So, Sorry, I clicked it and forgot to say it. So with that said, uh, Grant, you are up two minutes on the clock. Time starts when you speak. Sins of the Father is about a, a girl who comes to Blade, who is a vampire, who he was trying to uh, step in Blade's shoes and kill vampires. Her main focus is the revenge on her father, who is now a crime boss in, in Latvia, who is going after the, the innocent. And she wants to take revenge because she was forced to be turned into a vampire against her will. This is the story about Blade as a much older person. My uh, my opponent's story is um, I'm not too sure. Is he want? To, does he want to shoot it now? It, none, none of that was none of none of that was was said. Um, the aging and everything. It's it's not a great technology. It's fine. Um, my purpose of my film is to continue um the the legacy and the story of blade much longer he he went overseas he finished his job in america and he went overseas and this is now going back to his family roots and trying to deal with the problem which is the place that he's always tried to put off he didn't want to go back there the person who um is coming coming to him is a, is a young 17 year old girl called sophia played by millie bobby brown and her father is um alexander skarsgård um He's just known as the Don, and he, he's the person that is responsible for all this havoc and dis destruction of this town. My story revolves around Blade trying to rekindle some sort of love. Every, everyone's gone. Whistler's gone. The Night Bandits, they're all gone. He has no one, and he finds a connection with this, with this young girl who, like him, was forced to uh, be turned into something against her will. And strangely enough, the person who turned her father was also the person that turned turned um, him, Deacon Frost. So there's a connection that goes all the way back through, and it will continue on the story instead of living out some sort of uh, good guy and gets time. whack bad guy fantasy. All right. So four minutes of open debate time is there for the taking. Flush your stories, pick each other apart. I don't really care how you use it, but there's four on the clock. Time starts when the first person speaks. 
People like the Blade films because Wesley Snipes is a martial arts badass. No one wants to see old Blade in a movie where he seems like he's not even the main character. The 17-year-old is now the main character and he's teaching her how to do stuff. And it seems like I the plot re revolves more oh, around the 17 year I never said that. You're, you're, you're adding stuff to my thing. And no one wants to see an, an old, aging, tippy, superhero sort of thing. Uh, that's probably the reason why Logan failed, right? That no one liked Logan or saw Logan because he was old and, and decrepit. And, no, it's about the story about him. I stated it was about him going back to his hometown, his, his roots, dealing with something. This is just the plot. I never Logan had any sort of stuff. because the film was about Logan and the secondary female character, the story didn't revolve around her. It was more about Logan and his life. This doesn't sound like Blade and his life. This seems like it's teaching a new person how to become a new Blade. I don't want to see that. No, I want it's to not. see that as Wesley it, Snipes played. It, it's not because she's the actual antagonist. The whole point of it, the whole story is it's a trap. She's lulling him in because he's the daywalk. He's half human. He still ages. He still gets he still gets weaker. That's that's the point of it. And the fact of the matter is, Wesley Snipes being being the eighties, he can still kick the shit out of ninety five percent of the people on the planet. There's a reason no, why but, Marvel but, is not doing a multiverse film with Blade in it because no one wants to see an old Blade. People want to see a young Blade do I what he's doing. I, I didn't mention anything about a multiverse. You're, you're now adding stuff that's to That's why Mahesh Ali to is going to be the new Blade, because that's the kind of character, the kind of person we want to see be yes, Blade now. Completely, completely, completely different, completely different series. Okay. Zorro, but my own thing. Then, then we've got Zorro Batman and Joker. not the main character anymore, and he's teaching a new Zorro. We had we had Joker in one, one universe and Joker in another universe go going on. You can have different universes. Not everything has to be a cohesive giant giant pile pile of mess that doesn't have to happen that way this is this is pitching something for a fourth film of a franchise not a multi you know universal sort of thing your and film you, you've Snipe... missed the, you've missed the main point of your you, you've missed the main point of, of godfather part three it ended because every every action that he take it was hammered through that it's going to cost people and it's going to cost you but how it's costing him is not in his own pain and his own thing it's through the blood of his family it's through, it's through all the decisions Wesley that he made performance in blade three i don't want to see him in another film as blade he did scenes with his eyes closed and they had to cg his eyes open he does not care about this character anymore and i don't think he would have a good performance in of this course new he, cares about he literally did an interview saying he wanted to, he wanted to do it again brown at all you're talking about you're saying a, a character that doesn't care and had bad performances have you not seen any Al Pacino movie lately? He, yeah, he's Irishman a terrible actor now. He, he, really he, he, yeah, you picked you picked one film and you said you want to get Martin Scorsese to basically remake another another game. Not remake. We takes seen. elements like uh, stuff happening in the past and stuff happening in the future. And my, de -aging my, my, does my, work my, does work in Marvel films, and de aging did work in the Irishman. And I'd love to see a de aged Al Pacino in, 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 in tiny after scenes. the Godfather three, and then see what happens to him in twenty twenty one dealing with the way the world is now, on trial for his sins and everything that's happened to him. Adding, mod adding modern, modern politics to a 50s film, that's, that's going to be great. Adding him the He paid the price. That was the whole point. He was about family, and he he, he held his daughter his while she died. That was, that died. was the price. His that was the was price. Killed. He, yeah. you, what does that do to a man? I want to explore that. I want to see what happens right after that moment. I want to see Al Pacino be great his in a story. film franchise he, he that he's done in great agony. performances he, in that he's won an Oscar for. He would be amazing in Godfather no, 4. He, and then you bring he, Martin Scorsese. He paid the price already. You're just, it's a, it's a masturbatory fantasy about getting, getting and time. Done. That is time. All right. We will go ahead and move on to our one minute closings. Time starts. Uh, Sean, you're up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. I don't know who's writing this film. I don't know who's directing this film. I don't know a lot of the characters in it. Deacon Frost was a very forgettable villain. I don't care about his child or his, whoever is coming up after him to fight Millie Bobby Brown. What is this film gonna look like? I have no idea. What I have no visual in my head. I can't compare it to another film. At least with The Godfather Four, I know how Martin Scorsese, Scorsese directs. I know how Al Pacino acts. I've seen this world before. It's been a really good, wonderful world. I want to see it again. But the the pitch that he made for Blade Four, 
it's probably going to be another white guy directing it. He didn't say, I have no idea who's going to be. It. And then we're in our, our, our amazing comic book blade world where we have a central black character. We're now introducing a white female to kind of co-lead the film. Fuck that. I don't want to see that. And time. I don't only care if I lose this point now, but to bring race into it and act like because I, I brought a white woman, that it's no longer good. That is the most racist, disgusting shit I have ever heard of a, of a competitor. It does not matter what race a person is or anything like that. I, I, I find that utterly disgusting that you brought that into it. My film is going to be directed by McG. There you go. Another white guy. Here we go. You know what? I'm even going to get it written by a white guy. You know what? Here, who, who even knows? The fact that you even go there as an argument and trying to try to use that, it's disgusting. It's it's the, the lowest form form of low. And it's considered the one thing that I cannot stand in this world. It's fucking racist. And I'm done with my fucking time. Okay. All right. I'll drop both of you guys to the back. Take a breather. Reset. As I bring in the judges. All right, so I'll give you guys another second to come up with your final decisions. Uh, 30 seconds on the clock. I have so many questions about Jason. Well, the questions cannot be answered. You'll have to answer based on what was pitched in 30 seconds to finalize your answer. All right. As we come up on the end of that time, and you are up first this time. Are you ready to go? Who? Oh. You're up first, Tammy. You. Yes, sir. Oh, shit. God damn it. Fuck, man. All right. So, um, in, in 30 seconds or less, where is your vote headed for this round? Oh, uh, God damn. I don't know. All right. I wrote down a lot of good stuff. Um, I was glad that both of the guys cussed because they showed that they're grown men, you know, not little kids. Um, fuck, I had I had Sean winning it because gangster films. Um, he slightly edged me out because of the gangster film, you know, bringing new people in, the whole thing. But the, I mean, shit, man, the way. The way the end happened, I don't know, man. I mean, fuck. So I mean, bulk, bulk, focus on the bulk of the art. Okay, all right. If the if the end cancels it out, then focus on the bulk of the argument. So Sean, vote goes for Sean there. Yeah, I, Jacob, I go to you. What? Jacob, I go to you. Where does your vote go? Um, I'm gonna have to to go with Sean as well. Um, with these with the pitches, um, Sean was able to like actually pitch a story. And this whole um, going into Al Pacino's character on how this affected him, the death of his daughter, going from the de-aging to right after the death to present time, able to, to do that clear picture, um, really, really uh, solidified it for me. Because I was a little confused um, with Grant's, kind of the same with, with Sean's confusion. Um, I was in the same boat. Okay, all right, so with two votes to Sean, that means the point will go that direction. Our judges will hit the back for the moment as I bring in our competitors, and we head on to round number four. All right, so for question number four, the final question in regulation, should the point go to Sean here, it means we will move on to our blind round. Uh, with this last question, the what was presented to our competitors was... What is the best horror sequel of all time? Uh, over the next little bit, we have some really interesting horror sequels coming up, whether it's the latest in a never-ending franchise in Halloween Kills, which is just a fucking ironic title, uh, or something like Don't Breathe 2, which I don't think anyone expected a sequel to that film ever, but it exists, and it's coming very soon. So with that said, what is the best horror sequel of all time is where we are headed with this one. And Grant, you opted to go first on two and four, which means you are up first. I will remove myself. I will bring our timer back on, and the time will start when you begin speaking. When you think of a horror 
sequel, you, you need something that has the same essence as its original, but improves on, on that in, in in a certain way. Something that that can extend past the first film and the second film. Something that can build towards something that's much bigger and and and, and much better than uh, than the sum of some of its parts. The film that I picked is Saw Two. It is the second in um, the the Saw the Saw franchise, and it was the one that um, was the first to be taken seriously by uh, by the public because the first one came out. It was a little bit of an indie sort of thing. This one had a level to live up to, um, much in the same way that uh, like an Alien and Alien Aliens had. You know, you had to try and build on that. This film does that because it extends the universe. It creates a lot more intrigue to it. And for a series that's based on a lot of twists and turns, it has good ones that set up multiple future films. All right, absolutely. We'll go ahead and move on for the opening minute to Sean. Time starts when you begin speaking. The film I picked for what I think is the best horror sequel is The Evil Dead 2 directed by a very young Sam Raimi, starring a very young Bruce Campbell. Yes, they did this before in the first one. They came back for the second one, added more gore, more horror, more of a hyperkinetic horror, but also added so much of that amazing comedy aspect. And when you get the comedy and the horror and put it side by side, it makes both of those aspects a lot better. This bigger budget, it had way better special effects. He really refined the story. It just takes the first one and just makes it so much better. Bruce Campbell and Sam Raimi became gods after making this sequel. It is one of the best horror sequels ever made because uh, like, it's like a Terminator 2, like in Aliens. It just goes off on every level. And I love it. All right. So, Saw 2 versus Evil Dead 2, maybe not the most conventional answers, but ones our competitors are passionate for. Grant, you're up next, my man. You have two minutes to rebut and expand. Time starts when you speak. My film is a horror. It's, there's, it doesn't mix any other elements into it. It is a pure uh, a horror, horror film. It, it is horrifying. The fact of the matter is that you could see yourself being put in, in the Evil Dead world, and there's part of it that actually seems fun there's 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 this weird um thing and 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 he's right they became gods afterwards because their performances were great the films were good the films will i'll go even further than that they will bet they were better than good my film is the best sequel because of these reasons it continued the legacy of of, of the story it expanded upon it it added a brand new facet to it it essentially solidified the entire franchise based off that. Things that happened in this in in the second film are relevant in the fifth film, are relevant in the sixth film. Things that 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 have happened and the way in which everything gets ramped up and built up, it, it's terrifying. No one can look at you can look at so many scenes. You talk about gore and all the mad special effects and everything. Nothing in that film that he's talking about has the same level of gore or paint or retraction as that needle scene, putting your hand in and trying to trying to grab need, needles out. Because where that's a fantastical sort of um, world with where you know any any sort of thing can happen, it's still that far removed from essential reality that it's not as horrifying as because you could be put in that situation in store. You could be one of these people that that would take it. My film is a horror sequel, and it is the best horror sequel because it is an actual proper sequel to a horror film. Put your hands in and try and grab those needles. Just imagine the needles going through, like every little every little thing, because it's visceral. Where the other one is more of a spectacle, mine is visceral. And all right, perfect on the dot. Sean, you have an expansion and a rebut on hand. Two minutes starts and you begin speaking. It seemed like he was trying to say that my film is not a horror film. It is widely known as a horror film, and it was accepted by the host of this show as an answer for this question, which qualifies it as a horror film. The gore, the blood, and everything is severe in this film, 
and it is terrifying. There is, there's not a nice way to say it, but there is tree rape in this film that's not played for laughs. It is terrifying. When I look at Saw 2, it's a forgettable film. Evil Dead 2, that's a generational film. People remember that as one of the best horror films for that generation. One of the best horror films that have that has ever come out. Saw 2 is forgettable. Saw 6 is way better. The acting is way better. It makes more sense of this of, of the Saw story. It takes elements and switches them up. And if we talk about like the best sequel for the Saw franchise or for the horror Saw franchise, I would say Saw 3 is better than Saw 2. It just has a better pace. There's more tension. It just, there's better traps. I feel like the traps in Saw 2 were just kind of lazy. I feel like they were kind of just repeating Saw 1 and just with less interesting traps, like getting needles dropped on you and stuff like that. Plus the main guy who's killing everyone jigsaw now has a spoilers now has like a helper apprentice that i just did not like it it, it works better in in saw three when the apprentice you get more of a backstory and you're seeing her do stuff but in saw two i just it just i don't i don't think the public like it and i think that's why saw two is a forgettable film whereas the evil dead two as i said is so memorable the, all the deadites, the tree stuff that happens, him sawing off his arm, chainsaw and ash. All right. So before we head into the open debate round, uh, funny enough, on the same question in our first match yesterday, I kind of gave the same pointer out there. Uh, obviously, as debaters, you guys debate however you feel, but it should be said on a semantical note, Yes, uh, Evil Dead 2 does cross genres more than Saw 2 does, but it is definitely a horror film and was accepted. So just keep that in mind. With that said, there are four minutes of open debate on the table. Time starts when you begin speaking, whoever wants to go first. I never said that it wasn't a horror film. I said that it mixed genres. Mine is a pure horror film. That's what I said. That's the difference. Changing, changing my argument doesn't work. You're saying that Sick would have been a better one because of this, but none of that, none of everything that you said about the other films that would have been better wouldn't have existed without my my one. My one is the best sequel because it was the first one in there. It was the first one to build it up to a much bigger global audience. You're talking about your film. Yes, there, yes, there is, but it's so fantastical. It's so it's it's so weird and and out there with it mine is a genuine real life type horror yours is a mystical sort of horror one of them can actually really happen to you one of them it's it's a campfire story sort of thing it's just a great because film. it's the it, first sequel doesn't mean it's the best one just because it lays down some groundwork no, I, doesn't I said, mean it's the I best one if you look at the fast and furious franchise if you look at fast and furious franchise the first sequel is crap it's not good just like Who saw the 2 talking about saw fast 3 and is a way better film the argument. Film. and You're the fantastical changing the argument again. Weird elements Stick of the on evil topic. dead 2 doesn't make it a worse uh, sequel. It, it's still a great sequel. I feel like you just personally don't like those elements. It's still an I amazing thing. I think you personally, I think you personally don't like, like the ones in my one. You said the needle part. You, the needle part isn't scary. It's still considered one of the in the majority of of listeners. It's still one of the most horrifying things. The tree rape scene is a very disgusting, weird scene. Yes, I'll, I'll give it that. But that's not the entire film. I'm talking about everything in in my film is. It's great. My, mine's the best sequel because it builds off the previous Johnny one. Johnny Wahlberg make, is make... absolutely awful in Saw 2. His performance is way better in Saw 3 when he comes back. The characters in Saw 2, they're, they're just stupid and they're just falling for traps. It, it, it's it's like the, the, the intelligence of the, of the characters has gone down. The characters in Saw 3 and Saw 6 are just a lot better. I like the way those directors took the You can uh, keep arguing about films that I'm not, I'm not even making. You're not even staying on topic again. My my film is is the best horror sequel because it builds. That's the whole point. You're what you're just saying. It's a better film than the first one. That's what you're saying. It's a it it's doesn't a it's build. Not, Saw two is a step not, down from Saw one, and then Saw three brings it back up, and that's why the franchise has kept going. No, it's not. So because it was so bad that they didn't they didn't greenlit two films after it came out. That's because yes, because I knew three was going to be better. You're, you're I'm making not arguments Saw against things that, 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 that haven't happened. It was happened. just worse than other sequels that have come out in that franchise. 
Whereas doesn't Evil Dead 2 is way better than yeah, the doesn't third. Doesn't matter whether, whether your opinion. You're not saying anything. You're okay. Well, your film is worse than every other horror film that that, that involves him. You didn't even pick the best the best sequel in your one. Uh, Ash vs Evil Dead. That the first episode would have been that would have been. That's that, a that, TV that, series, that's, not a film. This is film to be. It's a sequel. That's the question. It's a sequel. It's still a sequel. It's not. You a could have still argued the first. The, 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 the first episode. Not, you still could have argued. Argument. It's not based on everything. You have one, you have one minute left. Evil, Move on. Evil Dead is way better than because Army of, Army of Darkness, You're... which is a sequel in that franchise with the same characters. What you just brought up is a TV show. Yeah, I know. Saw I brought three and Saw saying... Six are way better. In terms it wasn't. Of acting, it wasn't even good enough to go back to the movies. My films, one, the my character motivations are way better. Saw Two is a my step film, down. It was my film has cre- Saw my two, film was created. The another original eight script for sequels. Saw Two wasn't even for that film. It was a different film, and they changed that script because of how good so that it, was. it would fit into a Saw franchise. That's why it You're is such a bad it, film because it doesn't no, belong it's, in the Saw franchise. It's not film. It's the best sequel. You still don't even know the you still don't even know the question. It's what's the best horror sequel? A film called sequel Desperate, is a part of it. it and, uh, and Lin Manuel, eight sequels. They changed it, gave it to make into sequels. a Saw film, and that's why it just eight is sequels bad. and time. All right, there will be one minute to close for each of you. Grant, you are up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. The question is, what's the best sequel? A sequel, that, a sequel is something that takes something from the original and, and moves it along in, in a much better way and, and produces stuff way towards the future. My film was so good that it was able to extend the life of the Saw, the Saw franchise into other films. And the best part about it is when films can, can do that, they can, they can build stuff up. Um, on top of each other, the film that he's the film that he's talking about is a good film. It's 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 a great film. Mine's better because it actually answers the question: What is the best sequel? He's just talking about the best movie. He's talking about what he considers the best movie and everything. He, nothing has been spoken about to do with moving moving the, the the franchise forward or about the past or anything. It's just purely about this film. The question is: What is the best sequel? The se- a sequel is a part of a sequence. This one builds up to it. Stuff that happens in this one is relevant in the first one. It's relevant in the sixth one, as he already stated. Stuff that happens in the sixth one is relevant to this one. He answered my point for me. Mine is the best because it's a part of a part part of a sequence, and, and that's why it's the best sequel. All right, Sean, you have one minute left. Time starts when you begin speaking. It takes elements from the original and makes it better. The Evil Dead Two was pretty much a remake of The Evil Dead, except made a lot better. And because of its success, now good of a film it was, Evil Dead 3, came, The Army of Darkness came out, which is another great film in that franchise. And if you're talking about Saw 2 uh, led the way for other Saw sequels, well, you brought up The Evil Dead show. You brought up that show. If it wasn't for The Evil Dead 2, there wouldn't be a show. And stuff from that film franchise wouldn't have been included in that show. So that whole argument about Saw 2 setting up stuff, I don't think that's a that's a good argument at all because so much has come out of The Evil Dead and that would not have happened if The Evil Dead was, wasn't was such a good film. It's universally, critically acclaimed by fans and critics, it is a generational film. Who, who remembers Saw 2? Do the judges even think about the plot of Saw 2? Like, everyone remembers The Evil Dead 2. And that will be time on the debate. Another good round, gentlemen. I will go ahead and seat you in the back as I bring up my judges to make the final decisions. I'll go ahead and give them a couple seconds to get their last answer in. Wow. All right, so since he is ready and he's going first, I will pop over to him. Mr. Papa West, uh, who gets your vote and what is the main reason why? I'm just going to say this with a very um, sad fact because I don't like horror films. I remember Saw 2. Uh, with that being said, though, I am giving my point to Grant um, because with the sequel, you take uh, your, you take the idea and you move forward. He was able to move the idea forward. Um, Sean made the comment he, uh, of Evil Dead 2 is a remake of Evil Dead just better and didn't really expand how it was better, whereas Grant did. Uh, also, watch the crosstalk, please. Don't yell over each other because sometimes the judges cannot hear what you're saying. 
a lot of times when that's going on. All right, Mr. Diaz, uh, in 30 seconds or less, give me your winner of that round and the main point why. I also remember songs here by Gary Gilbert Sean because uh, he got a full attack on Grant's heavy weight and Grant's bad motor trying to defend any thoughts here rather than pulling down for familiar Sean to pull it down for example, as example. Even calling out Grant, uh, Grant on the whole huge TV argument thing. Yeah, that's the other song. I'm really surprised by how well he did. They do a great job, but Sean really clowns something. All right, so it is one vote to one vote, which means, Mr. Blanche, the match right now hangs in your balance. Who is your vote going to for this round? <clears throat> My vote is going to Sean. He really killed it in the battle round where they were both talking. You know, I think he learned from the other rounds. Um where he just uh, kept talking about, you know, he just kept uh, deflecting Grant film, you know, and saying like, hey, Saul don't mean shit, you know, like, you know, um, I thought that was a beautifully done. So I'm gonna have to give it to him, man. You know, Saul, uh, when he came up with uh, Evil Dead versus Saul, you know, he was just able to put the nail in the coffin of how he kept talking about, you know, Saul too, didn't really, um, reflect you know the saw six so i'm gonna give to sean all right so with that said that means sean will achieve his second point of the match gentlemen i will go ahead and drop you to the back we are not done just yet thank you so much for your participation thus far and that means as i bring our competitors back in we are into the blind round the score is two to two uh, these gentlemen are going uh, to be receiving a question that had been randomly predetermined, but they do not know what said question is. With that said, the way that the blind round works is once I give them the question, they will be given uh, some time to think of an answer. When we come back, the competitors will fight the same way that they did before and we will get to it. So with that said, gentlemen, your question before we go off screen is, what is the best adaptation of Romeo and Juliet to film of all time? Baz Luhrmann's. Okay, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo plus Juliet. Sean, you have your answer. Uh, West Side Story. West Side Story is an acceptable answer. All right, guys, we are back from the blind round prep. As uh, was uh, said before we went off air, the two competitors selected their Romeo and Juliet films. Mr. Grant has gone with Baz Luhrmann's, uh, as written, Romeo plus Juliet. Uh, Sean Hunter has gone with West Side Story. Uh, so with that said, the rules itself remain exactly the same, same amount of time, same style of debate as no extensions were used. So with that said, uh, Grant, because you answered first, you will have the advantage to go first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Oh, so I have to go first, do I? Yes. Okay. When you think of a quintessential Romeo and Juliet story, you think of a Romeo and, and Juliet story. Something that, um, I mean, the story's, the story's time or something that captures what was written, you know, those hundreds and hundreds of years ago. Um, and it brings, it brings together every single element of that. But because there's been numerous plays and everything like that, you want to have a little bit of a twist for it. Um, I picked the Baz Luhrmann uh, interpretation of Romeo, Romeo and Juliet, where they uh, they modernised it, where their blades are now, no, their guns are called blades, um, and the whole point of the film is to capture everything that was great about the about the original story, but modernise the point and bring every aspect of it forward to the point where it was it launched the careers of of, of so many people. 
Um, and it's still to this day looked back as the best adaptation. All right. That will be time on the one minute opening. Sean, you're up next. Time starts when you begin speaking. Can you just read the question again for me just before I start? That's fine. The question is, uh, and it's on, or it should, should have been on screen. There we go. What is the best adaptation of Romeo and Juliet of all time? The best adaptation of Romeo and Juliet is West Side Story. It's a classic. It won 10 Oscars. It's extremely memorable. If, even if you take out knowing that it's in the category of Romeo and Juliet adaptations, it's still an amazing, fantastic film that is like just almost groundbreaking in that adaptions of William Shakespeare. If you look at, yeah, it just, the adaptions of William Shakespeare, it's groundbreaking. What, the, both of these films are adaptions. They're not period accurate. The period I like more is West Side Story thrown into this period of the 50s and 60s, seeing the songs come out, seeing the dancing come out, and just the amazing directing, cinematography, choreography. It stands the test of time. For me, I enjoyed this film way more than Baz Luhrmann's weird Romeo plus Juliet. And time. All right, Grant, you are up again for your rebuttal expansion. You have two minutes on the clock to yourself. Time starts when you begin speaking. My film is a ad adaptation to the point where it is an actual adaptation instead of something that is more of an inspiration. Um, talk about cinematography. Uh, you talk about choreography, Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet or Romeo plus Juliet, depending on what region of the world that you're in, is far more superior. My film takes the brave, it was the brave enough to take the dialogue and everything from that and put it into setting where people wouldn't half understand what was, what was going on. Reinterpret, reinterpret different scenarios and different scenes in a way to the point where from start to finish, you know this is a Romeo and Juliet film it has all the elements from the original it has the original dialogue it has everything my opponent film is a we'll call it what it is it, it's a loosely based um adaptation in the same way that house is sherlock holmes it's it's within it's within the same vein um these he's he, he story and everything it's a great film for for its time um he's talking about how it's it's been good for years to come. My film's going to be just as good in the same amount of years. The difference is he's had the years to be able to say that his film has lasted. My one is still the best adaptation. You ask any person around what is the best Romeo and Juliet film, you will get Baz Luhrmann's Romeo and Juliet. Cinematography on it, he, he launched the careers of all these all, all these actors that, that are in it. And yeah, maybe I'm a bit biased because he's a fellow Aussie, but I will I will take that I will take that into uh, into consideration. The film itself is brilliant. People who don't even understand half the thing were mesmerised by it because it was it was faithful to what it was. It modernised to the point where it made it for a modern audience, and even people who like his film will love it. And time. All right. So, Sean, you have two minutes to expand and rebut. Time starts when you begin speaking. Better adaptation because it lifted the exact words off the page, but also it was said in the modern day. So you have all this, I don't even know what, I guess, old-time English in this movie. And then you have, you know, modern clothing, you have guns, you have modern music. You can't have your cake and eat it too. It can't be part of adaption following his his uh, play word for word, and then everything else is set in the modern time. West Side Story, it's all set in that period. And when it came out, it was the modern time. It is a better film because it's very understandable for audience. It's more uh, visually pleasing and you're able to understand it because Baz Luhrmann's directing, it's all over the place. A lot of flash cuts, a lot of people are turned off by that. And I, I think, other than the language that is lifted for Romeo plus Juliet, that West Side Story is a more um, 
it, it's it's a better adaption. I think it follows the story of Romeo plus Juliet closer because it's not clashing between the old old stuff that was written for the play and the new modern stuff like Romeo plus Juliet. It all makes sense. The names are different. The gangs are different. The characters name different, but it's the exact story. It's lifted, and you can see it clearly. I don't think it's a loose adaption. I think it's it's more and better adaption interpretation than Romeo plus Juliet, which I don't personally like. It's not a good movie. Just taking out the William Shakespeare stuff, the Romeo plus Juliet stuff, if you just compare the films, Romeo and uh, West Side Story is a better film. It won 10 Oscars. 10 Oscars. There's been so many remakes of Romeo plus Juliet, of Romeo and Juliet. There has never been a remake that's out yet of West Side Story because it stood the test. And concert. time. And time. All right. There are only five minutes from six, technically, that stand between the end of the game and a win. Four of those minutes you have to fight for. Time starts when one of you speaks. You stated you stated a couple of things that I'm, I'm going to get off the bat. You said that oh, mine couldn't be uh, an adaptation because it mixes stuff. It's called it's called fusion. It's called uh, it's called updating. And the fact of the matter is that yours really doesn't in incorporate much of it either. Mine incorporates more, so it's much more of a faithful adaptation. And you even stated it's it's your film is a better film. That's not the question. Once again, moving the goalpost. What is the best adaptation of it? Not which is the better film. No, which is that you're, you're it's putting a better your argument in that's the better film. Because it's way easier to understand the story of Romeo plus Juliet. It's laid out a lot more clear. I can understand the English that is used. You said so that you don't a understand, of you didn't understand it, it's not as good. Adaption. It, because you couldn't understand the thing, it's it's not as it's not as good. You're talking about its accolades for, for the film. The film, the film is great. Um, but it's not, we're talking about a adaptation. The question is, which is the best adaptation? Mine's the best adaptation because it adapts, it modernizes it. You said about guns, I already said that. They called their guns modernize blade. It. the blade. It places yes, it, it in does. a modern, uh, uh, um, it, you just said, you just said, it, it places, places it in a modern setting, modern it modernizes it. The language is not modernized. Yes, it's That's a fusion. It's That's funky, the beauty of part of it. Adaptation. Whereas You're West talking West about Baz Luhrmann. You don't like Baz Luhrmann's the Baz, Luhr, Baz Luhrmann's jump cuts. You're talking about a lot of people did. You're talking about you talking for about William jump Shakespeare cuts. adaptation. For an, adapt, doesn't make adaptation. sense to have Baz Luhrmann's jump cuts in it. Well, by your own definition, because it's a, it's a, it's a modern thing. Romeo and Juliet shouldn't be filmed. It's a play. You're taking one part and, and saying, "Why don't I have it to be this?" Because it, yes, it has half modern and half old William Shakespeare. That's play. what a also fusion, another thing you said is it launched the career for many of those actors. Um, Leonardo DiCaprio is already an A-list actor. He was coming off Titanic two years before this film. So I, I don't think that's true that it launched the career for all these actors. And Claire Danes, it did, definitely. Not for John uh, Liguiamo and other actors in yeah. the film. Yeah, sorry, thank you for that. Yeah. I mean, you want to you wanna have... Ha, ha, have your cake in it too by saying, "Well, it's 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 an ad adaptation, but no one's remade it. Yet there's been other remakes of Romeo and Juliet. So if you want to have your cake and eat it too, you can do the same scenario. I can throw the same argument straight back at you. Mine is an adaptation. Baz Luhrmann modernized it. You even used the word. You said, "Oh, it's in a modern setting." Yes, that's called modernizing. He infused well, the old with the new, modern... and people loved it. It was an award-winning film. So just because, because it didn't win the a modern award... setting and the old English. Because you have both of those, it just clashes, and that's what makes it a worse adaption. Because it's harder no, it to doesn't. understand. That's what makes and it a better adaptation. It's not as pleasing. It's not as simple to the audience to understand. Tasting. With West Side Story, I understand the love that Marina and Bernardo have. It didn't adapt have. anything. It just it just had it had loose themes that were related to it. No, Mine's it was the full theme. It was the full story of Romeo plus Juliet. It had themes. Mine is an adaptation. Yours is a it theme. Theme full story theme of Romeo plus Juliet. Story. Yours is a theme-inspired story. Mine's an adaptation. There is a difference. Yours has a theme because it's set in modern times. It's a theme story as well, except my theme works better because the language is of that time period. That my the theme, theme works because in. it's an adaptation. My it's film is also going an on and putting it into a modern setting. And it's the better adaptation because it's you said clearer. Your, you said yours was modernized in, in, into its time back then, but because you like the film better, it's, it works, but because you don't like my one, it doesn't work. Your, your film is not a true adapt, adaptation to it. It takes things from it, 
Mine is more true. They are both adaptations, no, correct? But your mine film is a more true one, and it's a it. better adaptation. My film takes the story and puts it in modern time, whereas your film takes the language and puts Where's it Where's Romeo? Where are they? Where, where is that in there? What's the most iconic one from it isn't even in the film. And time. All right. One minute left for each competitor to decide all for this match. Grant, you are up first. Time starts when you begin speaking. Romeo, we're out there, is in the film because the characters are Romeo and Juliet. It's an adaptation because it, it has – your one is an inspiration. Mine's an ad, 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 adaptation. They are both – yours is an adaptation like this. Mine's an adaptation like this. The question is which is the best adaptation. Mine is better at adapting the stuff that's happened. You've got every theme that's going on going on there. You've got the, the same storylines. You've got fantastic acting. You've got fantastic visuals. It – Maybe because it's a part of its times, but it looks ten times better than your film. Looking at through through modern eyes, my film looks phenomenal. It, it is great. It has the pain, the anguish behind behind every 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 action. Your film is is great, but it's more remembered for clicking and dancing and other sort of stuff. Where mine is remembered purely and simply because it is a great no, the best adaptation. Mine adaptation, yours is inspiration. There is a huge difference, and that's what the question is. And that will be time. Uh, Sean, you will have one minute on the clock when time starts, when you speak. West Side Story is the greatest adaption of Romeo and Juliet. It has the exact same story beats as the play. Romeo plus Juliet is a bad adaptation because it mixes modern music, modern guns and weapons, and modern clothing, and you don't really know what you're watching. It's very confusing, whereas West Side Story, you feel the pain of those characters. You understand where each of, the, uh, of those characters come and what families they're in and what gangs and why they don't get along. It's so much easier to understand and so much more relatable and a true adaptation of Romeo and Juliet because things don't clash. There's no jump cuts. It's easier to understand. The jump cuts and Boz Lerman's direction ruins the adaptation because it pulls you out of it and you start to forget that you're watching Romeo plus Juliet. You think you're watching some crazy LSD-fused film. All right. That will be it for the game, gentlemen. I just want to say before I pull both of you off, great job throughout this whole game, guys. Lots of passion, lots you of You need to work your wording a little bit better than that. So the judges before shouldn't pull... listen to what he's saying now? Okay. This is not part of the round. No, 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 I'm, I'm saying he said before I pull both you gentlemen off, I'm just saying what's your words, Aaron? That sounded a little bit, um... You said you, before you pull both of, the, both of us off? I, I, I Never mind. The joke's gone. All right. All right. Let's go ahead and bring the judges on screen uh, for the last time in this match. Gentlemen, do we need another couple of seconds to respond or are we good to go? Okay, to go. All right, Jacob needs a couple of seconds, so I'll go ahead and give it to you. Uh, for what it's worth, uh, I like the Franco Zeffirelli version of the film. Uh, not because I remember anything about that film. It's because that motherfucker looks a lot like Zac Efron. Uh, and that makes it worth it enough to watch it. Uh, is that the, uh, like, 1967-1968 version? It is, yeah. Seriously, I, I, remember seeing, I remember seeing the girl's boobs for, like, that long. Um, and then you see her butt. You know, for what it works, my favorite version, besides my sister, actually, in Lion King 2, to be <laughs> All right, so let's finish this up, boys and, and girls. There's no girls here right now, but let's finish this up, boys. All right, Chris, I will go to you in 30 seconds or less, preferably less. Give me who is your winner for that round and what pushed you over the edge. Uh, just so tough. I mean, I like both of them. Are you going to Sean? I think he hit a bit a lot more, especially on the combo with Bond Lehman when we were talking to him. He was trying and he fought up. So, it let him on maybe about some of the combo on the situation, where I won't mention, but they're not combo. 
Okay. Yeah, but I want to I don't, I don't think it on me is. All right. So first vote goes to Sean. I move on to Mr. Haven Pendergast. Where does your vote for this round go to? Um, unfortunately, my vote is uh, going to go to Grant. He had a stronger argument. He uh, displayed the scenes from the film a lot better. Um, you know, Sean w kept talking about West Side Story, you know, how it was great for his time. But Grant was able to bring a better argument for the time that we're living in now, you know. Um, so I'm going to give it to Grant. All right, which means we move up to Papa West. Uh, whatever is written on that board decides the game, sir. So in 30 seconds or less, let's rip the Band-Aid off one way or the other. Who is your winner of this round? Great. Um, biggest thing, uh, in his two-minute, he made the comment of um, it takes the actual words from the play, modern brings it into the movie, modernizes it enough to where you understand what's going on. He used the example of blades are the guns. They call them blades, but they're actual guns. And talked about how that worked. And then Sean was like, it just, you can't do that. It's you're uh, having your cake and eating it too is the analogy he used. Although Grant just right before that said how it works. All right. That was, so yeah. with that, gentlemen, thank you so much for your assistance tonight. I will go ahead and drop you all to the back. Because with that, ladies and gentlemen, and your winner by a final score of three to two, it is Mr. Grant Gregory with the finish up. And we will go ahead and talk to yourself first. All right, Grant, let's go ahead and talk about it, man. Obviously, uh, as you said at the start, you know, whenever you play, it is a passionate affair. And I would say that this was nothing less than that. Um, with that said, you know, uh, any tension that may have risen aside, how are you feeling about winning and going into that 1-0 bracket? Um, yeah, I mean, to be undefeated is awesome. Um you know, you tell me you're going to throw me in the ring with some rookie that doesn't know anything. Oh, this is the hardest match I've ever freaking had. Jesus Christ. I mean, if, it, if this guy was, if this guy had been playing as long as I had, he would have freaking wiped the floor with me. If this is his first match, then I feel sorry for the next person that he has to verse. Like, that was ridiculous. Well, he haven't heard uh, things that I thought I could rebut, and then I rebut them, and he rebuts my rebuttal. I rebut that, and then he's doing it, and I'm just like, oh. And then by the end of it, the time's up, and I haven't made any freaking points. I'm just too busy rebutting on some of them. Uh, I lost <laughs> my shit in, in, um, in one of those questions, and um, yeah, I shouldn't have, but I stand by what I said. I don't like, I, I don't like that sort of um, wording and racism and that with it. It just it's one of my pet peeves. Um, doesn't matter. Doesn't matter any anything about race or anything like that. I treat everyone uh, the exact same, and doesn't matter as long as they're qualified to do it. That's all that matters to me. Um, but yeah, like I, I'm, I'm thinking if this was a round one, if this was a round first round of a bracket, I mean, I'm not looking forward to the next one. God. Well, speaking of the next one, um, it it has. A man, potentially, who has already said publicly he wants your ass. Uh, you will be taking on the winner of either rookie Noah McCausland or uh, longstanding TMG player Henry Sanchez. Uh, the oh, I, mean, I, know, of... I know Henry. I know. I know Henry wants my ass. He saw me in my workout video, and um, he used a tongue emoji. So I, I understand. I understand. He what, does what one he way or the that. other. He does want it, yeah. but if he yeah, wants I it mean, on this, I understand. Field, He's he 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 is my uh, my my biggest fan. He sends me love letters and everything. So um, I'm I'm hoping that he wins to fulfill his make a wish dream of actually versing me. I think that'll be a, a fun match. Um, but you know he's got to win his match too. So who knows? Absolutely. Well, Grant, thank you so much for playing with us here tonight, brother. We will see you in the future. Uh, that being said, I'll be sure to give you a decent enough break. I'll send you some water. Uh, I may need help with the shipping costs because, you know, you're a little far from me. But we'll get it figured out, man. Have a great night. Thank you for competing, and we will see you next time on the Battleground. Thanks, Chief. 
All right, and with that, we'll go ahead and bring in. I I, I can't call him a loser, man. Sean Hunter. <laughs> uh, yeah, I I think uh, what Grant said is correct. You know, things in more than just one question, things definitely got heated on the field. But I, I do like when people can give their dues at the end. Uh, yeah, I, I have to say, man, as somebody who hosted a lot of these and saw a lot of people compete, uh, you came in about as ready as you could. Uh, by the, the wheel of the fates, you got stacked up against an undefeated champ who I think did prove tonight why he is an undefeated former champ. Uh, but you played the best you could, and I stand with him when I say, God help the next person you get paired up against. How are you feeling right now? Uh, I haven't felt so much stress and these kinds of emotions in so long. Uh, I'm glad I can bring you happiness like that. <laughs> Parts of that match were stressful, but I still really enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun. Grant is an amazing player, especially like to be undefeated. And I, I guess now he's like 14 and 0. It was amazing that I could just, you know, go the distance with him after I got the first two, after I lost the first two questions, I thought I'm done. And I won the last two and then went to the fifth one. I was just uh, happy with my performance. I don't know if I want to do this again, just because it's so stressful. Um, and then again, with, with that fifth question, it was very, it was, it was, it, I, I, I understood what Grant was talking about, how it was kind of unfair. And it was kind it was kind of weird at first. Like, I was like, do I just yell out Romeo plus Juliet? Cause that's an that obvious answer. And I don't know, but you yell it out and type it in the chat. I just want to be fair. I don't want to rush things. And so we picked what we picked. That's what happened. But I think the right person won. He's, he's like a freaking goat. He like, he's amazing. I definitely took some notes on how to play and how to rebut. He's so quick and smart. Um, it was fantastic playing against him. Uh, the one thing I just want to address was the race thing in that for that one question, where um, I'm not bringing up race to win an answer or to win that point. I'm bringing up race because no matter what I'm answering, no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I am, I'm a person of color. And as a person of color, when I'm looking at media, film, and television, we don't have a lot of things. And to have something, and I know it's just a pitch, to have something, and then we introduce another element that kind of takes away from that, my culture, the people that I don't see that often, that really affects me. And I, 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 the things that I have, uh, that we have, I wanna, I wanna keep, you know? There's a lot of other films that white actors and actresses have, a lot of franchises, there's not a lot for POC characters, POC actors and whatnot. So that came from a place of me wanting to keep the very little things that we have. And again, there's, it was just, you know, got into a little bit of an argument. We said some things, but I think at the end of the day, our emotions obviously got heated. And I still think Grant's an amazing person. Um, and I still had a lot of fun with this match. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And, uh, I mean, I think it's worth looking at me and saying I don't find lack of representation. I mean, take away my skin color. Fat people have been the butt of the joke for ages, and all I do is make fun of myself. So I'm all right on that end. Uh, but absolutely, I think every part of that discussion is valid as long as it's true discussion in the effort of wanting positivity on both sides. And I think despite the fact that in the middle of a debate like that, it did get very heated uh, I do have to commend you both because I think you have both made clear that neither of you want negative things for any community. And it is all about positivity on that end of it. Uh, so it did get heated in the obvious moment because of where it happened. But again, I, I have the utmost respect for people who can take that put aside and still give everyone their dues. So I, I, again, uh, it's something that happened. There's no point in not talking about it, but I do appreciate both of you guys and the professionalism that you bring to this. And I can't say you didn't bring professionalism on your first go around. Uh, with that said, your next match is up against uh, two people who one of them has definitely debated before. One is a rookie, uh, Jonathan Peck taking on Chadwick Webb. Uh, I don't know what you know about either of those competitors, whether it be in something like trivia or if you know anything about them from debate. Uh, but if you happen to have a preference to lose that match to play you, who would you like to see? Uh, I don't know either of them. So. Fair enough. All right, uh, so, so whatever's, with, what, whatever's less stressful. Pardon? That, that's, that's less stressful. I must admit, 
uh, I, it was, obviously I was nervous going into this because Grant told me his record in the chat, but he was he was actually like very helpful with some of the tips that he gave me. So I'm really thankful for that. Uh, and sorry if during some of the rebuttals I talked over him. It was in the heat of the moment, but uh, I tried not to as best as I could. <laughs> All right, man. Well, thank you for playing. Uh, this invite also is stretched out to grant uh, any hospital bills that are attained from the filming of this episode. I will pass on to my parents' lawyers, so just send them over and they'll handle it. Uh, I'll just try and get them to ask as little questions as possible. Uh, but with that said, thank you, Sean, and we will go ahead and drop you to the back. And guys, that is the end of another great episode of Movie Battleground. We're only two episodes in, and we've already had Probably one of the funnest matches I've ever been a part of. And this was an intense back and forth battle between two competitors that have shown both of them going into separate brackets for a tournament. Uh, I think they could both really go the distance if their hearts don't give out first. We will see what happens on the show. Uh, with that said, guys, this week of Battleground is not over. Make sure you tune in tomorrow, Wednesday. With that said, my name is Aaron Canole. Please be sure to check out everything in relation about this channel and our sister channel, TMG Trivia, and everything they are posting. And I'll see you guys on the next time for Movie Battleground. Take care.